can remember as I travel around, but I have to be careful because it's a, it's a blonde joke. Would I get in trouble if I did that? I don't know. I, I was hoping we had all redheads here this morning or something. I didn't know, but I, uh, uh, you know, blonde ladies. And, but nowadays, you know, you could be, if you're like ladies at my church, you could be redheaded this week and blonde next week. And then, you know, so you never know. And um, I'm just, I'm, I'm going, I'm, mine's turning, but anyhow, it's uh, like your preacher, a little bit of gray. But a, bl- a blonde lady, uh, you know, they have a reputation sometimes and, uh, this lady with blonde hair walked into the library and walked up to the librarian and said, um, I'd like a cheeseburger and fries and a large Coke. And the librarian said, what did, what did you say? And the uh, blonde lady said, I would like a cheeseburger and fries and a large Coke. And the librarian said, ma'am, I don't know what in the world's wrong with you or what you're thinking, but this is a library. And the blonde lady said, oh, I'm sorry. I'd like a cheeseburger and fries in a large coat. <laughs> Isn't that a funny joke? Don't you like that one? That's my favorite in the whole wide world. And if you got offended, I'm sorry, all right? And then if you don't understand, blonde ladies, we'll explain it to you after the service, all right? But that's my Rebecca's, since she's blonde, that's her favorite joke. But uh, sure is good to be in the house of the Lord and uh, with God's people and and uh, hope this morning God will speak to our hearts and, and uh, just take this time and, and challenge us and, and what God could do in our lives if we were to really surrender to him and, and uh, give our lives to him uh, even this morning. Uh, if you would, get your Bibles and turn to the book of 1 John. We're going to look at some scriptures today and ask the Lord to speak to us and take this time and uh, challenge us in a great way that we might be what God wants us to be. I want to We'll probably start in 1 John chapter 2 and look through some verses and go back and look at them. I uh, love the book of 1 John. It is just a a wonderful book. Every new Christian ought to read it. It talks about life in Christ, what it means to be a Christian and new life in Christ. And trust that the Lord will just take this this morning and, and challenge you and I that we could be what we should be for the Lord. 1 John chapter 2 first, verse 29. I just want to read this. and It says, if you know that he is righteous, talking about Christ, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Turn over a page to chapter 3 in verse 9. Chapter 3, verse 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin... For his, God's seed, remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. Look at chapter 4, verse 7. Another page page over. Beloved, let us love one another. Love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Look at chapter 5 and verse 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. Look at verse 4. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And then verse 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. Let's pray. Father, help me this morning as I speak on the signs of new life, yes, even new life in Christ. I pray that each one of us would examine ourselves today and ask ourselves, are we truly a child of God by the, according to the measurement of Scripture? May we as Christians today desire to as we are children of God, win some victories in our life and, and Lord, grow in Christ in these last days. And Father, just take this message and stir us and use it. May your Holy Spirit have his will and way. Now we ask and pray in Jesus' name, amen. They say in a phrase that life is correspondent to its environment, or I like to put it another way, where there's no outward expression of life, there is death or there is no life. I do believe in studying scripture here and looking at this that 
I see that where there in a Christian's life, where there is no outward corresponding life being shown, it may mean there's no life on the inside. The Bible says that, and we look at a number of verses through John, it's very plain. When a person is born of God, there's some outward signs that begin to take place. I believe every Christian grows. Some grow at faster pace than others. Uh, some grow slow, some are 100 yard dashers, some are marathon runners, but I believe where there is life, there truly is growth. I believe that's true in a five year old child. I believe that's true in a 70, 80, 90 year old man or woman. I believe it's true in a 47 year old. Where there is life, where God is, uh, there will be growth, maturity. There'll be outward signs of what's taking place on the inward part. Sometimes I tell folks, here's maybe the reason we act like the devil uh, maybe, and, and try to uh, convince ourselves that we are Christian. Maybe we ought to go back and go back to the root of things and see what's taking place on the inside. But 1 John, first of all, chapter 5, verse 1, tells us of a certainty in Jesus Christ. I preached the other Sunday at my church. Uh, we're a mission church too, and I want people to know and understand what we believe and I had a guy come to our church two weeks ago. He's a, he's a best friend of my son, and uh, we all did a lot of motorcycle riding together and met this fella, and he comes to our home for uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas. And uh, if you were to meet Dane, uh, he has uh, got two full sleeves of tattoos. Um, his recent haircut is a mohawk, six of about uh, six or eight inches uh, in the air. Um, and you say, wait a minute, you let that guy in your house? I sure do, I love him like a son. And he loves us. He calls me his pops, you know, or second dad and, and comes around. And, he's, and you say, well, why? When he was 12 years old, he went to a youth camp and got saved, made a decision for Christ. Came home the next week and his dad and mom sat him down and said, we're getting a divorce. And it devastated him. And he went through a time of years of a cutting problem, cutting himself with razors and hurting himself, <laughs> punishing himself for the wrong things he had done. And what a sad picture it was. He learned one day that he could do it with tattoos and it be cool and everybody accept him and like him for his uh, uh, defaming of his body and what he was doing. He's one of the uh, coolest guys in town now. He's uh, 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 becoming a rap artist and these kind of things. He rides motorcycles better than anybody I know. We, you know, he's one of these guys that can, we, we ride sport bikes. He can ride for, I think last time, eight miles on the back wheel doing 90 miles an hour, you know, and those, and then stop it on the front wheel. And he does the videos and, and just, you know, the world would look at him at such a cool and, and, and wonderful uh, guy. And he comes to our house. But last week uh, he came to the church Easter egg uh, party and fellowship we had on Saturday night and, and so he was going to put on Facebook to all his friends uh, you know um, that he was at Cape Fear Free Will Baptist Church and he said man what should I say and, and, and one of the guys said say they'll never believe that I'm here you know at church and, and he did and took a picture of us and we did that and, and my son David said you ought to put on there under the blood and Dane said I don't think I even know what that means under the blood and I thought about that's true of so many people in the world today. And so I preached the other Sunday on uh, the Passover, what it meant when that dad, in obedience to God, took that little lamb of a, of a year's age and a spotless lamb and took it in his home and would slay it and, and take the meat and, and, and eat of it and, and burn the rest in the fire and take that hyssop and dip it in the blood and, and mark it on the top doorpost and the sides of the post. And that night as the destroyer or that angel of, that God had appointed as a death angel that evening would come across and kill all the firstborn of Egypt. If you were in that house that night when the destroyer came by, if you were under the blood that evening, now you could get up and walk outside if you wanted to and say, I'm a Jew, I'm, I'm from Israel. Didn't matter. God's, God's command were to be under the blood. And, and in the New Testament, here's the way it's put in the New Testament, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. Uh, any man, and that's the picture of safety and security to me is that evening as you hear the cries of Egypt, the death of the firstborn, uh, I know that we've been obedient to God 
God and the blood has been placed on the doorpost in obedience to God and I am safe and secure in Christ uh, that evening and here's, here's what it means to be under the blood and in Christ. Has there ever been a time that you have taken, uh, the, not physically, but uh, metaphorically, if you will, the blood of Christ and applied it to my life, been washed in the blood. We sing those songs. Um, uh, uh, how precious is the blood. That's the picture of it and what it means uh, to be born again and to be a Christian. I'm not here on my own merit. I'm a, a Jew. I'm, a, I'm a, on the right side of town. I'm not an Israelite. I am safe and secure tonight on the merits of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. His blood that was shed has been applied to my life. That's what it means to be born again and a Christian. And 1 John 5 says this, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ, that man is born of God. Everyone that loveth him that begot, that's the Father, loveth him also that is begotten of him. Now here's what I'm talking about tonight. Can I, or this morning, I've been up for a while already, a certainty in Jesus Christ. This man talks about when I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ uh, is I am born of God, you say. And it's more than an intellectual belief. It's more than an intellectual assent. Yes, I believe in Santa Claus and Christmas and, and the Easter Bunny and, and all those kind of things. That's not what it's talking about up here. Somebody said most people miss heaven by about this far, the difference between their mind and their heart. But to believe or to confess the, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is to say with my mouth and with my life and my heart, yes, what God said that Jesus Christ must die for the sins of the world, that his offering and sacrifice was accepted on my behalf. Yes, I believe that. I believe what God says. And my confession is saying, yes, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, I died for the sins of the world and apply him on my behalf. I believe, listen to me, our religion has to be better than that of the scribes and Pharisees. And here's something else. The Bible says in James that even the devils believe and they tremble. Now here's what bothers me of many so-called Christians today. We say we believe, but there is no fear of God. Satan this very day believes God. He believes his word is why he fights it. And he trembles at the thought of the word of God of being preached or taught or told or you and I in our life. Uh, and I want to tell you something. If we can open up the portals of hell today and look down and hear their cries and ask them, are there any atheists in hell? Are there any unbelievers in that place called hell? I'm telling you, they are believers today. And so it's, we've got to be more than just an intellectual believer. There's got to be some kind of difference that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he died for the sins of the world. And I must take that sacrifice work that he did on the cross in my place, in my stead, and, and I allow that to stand for me. Yes, God, I believe you. Jesus Christ was prophet Priest and king. Prophet meaning he was the revealer of God to us, the revelation of God. You want to know God? We know him through Jesus Christ. Someone told me the other day that I believe God is at the top of a mountain and all of the different religions are at the bottom of the mountain making our way up to God and, and all of us one day will find God. I said that's good, but Jesus disagrees. And that's good as long as you don't read your Bible. For the Bible says Jesus Christ is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. And he is exclusive. And here is what I believe. He is the, if I want to know God, I know him through Jesus Christ, the Son of God, equal with God himself, who thought of himself of no reputation, but gave himself, if you will, to mankind. He is our priest. He is our mediator. He is our go-between. We had fallen in sin, separated from God. Jesus Christ, if you will, is the mediator between God and man. I can now, by the way, when he was crucified that day on the cross, the temple veil that separated the, the outer courts from the Holy of Holies, the Bible says that thick, I think it was three-inch thick curtain, was literally ripped in two down the middle, 
showing us that now we have access to the holiest of holies. We have access to God through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He is our mediator. He stands at the right hand of God today in heaven, mediating for you and I and interceding for us. When the devil comes and accuses me of a sin or accuses us of wrongdoing, then Christ stands and says, yes, but I stand for him. I represent him. My righteousness has been given to him, and I can stand here today with a certainty that I have been born again because I believed and trusted in Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. He is our King, meaning he is our Lord and Savior, meaning he, is, I'm, he is, has an authority over me. So many people, they want to say I'm a Christian, but they don't want Christ to have any authority over them. Here's what's happened. It used to be that people rebelled against God in the world and did what they wanted to do. Now they've come into church and say, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but I'm going to live for him like I want to. Who are you to ju Here's the new statement. Have you ever heard this one? Don't judge me. You know, I know I went out and murdered three people and I robbed two banks, but I'm still a Christian. Don't judge me. I'm sorry. But the Bible says that Christ, when I become a Christian, has, he is my prophet he is my priest, and he is my king and Lord, and he has a th I've been bought and paid for with a price. My life is not my own. I've surrendered to him and given my life to him. That's what the, it means to be a Christian, and that is one of the first signs that I am a believer in Christ is that I get a certainty and an assurance that I know for sure in whom I have believed, and that he is able to keep me against that day. There's something else that happens in 1 John Chapter 4, verse 7, we read it a minute ago. May I read it again? 1 John 4, verse 7. And I don't get excited. I just get a little warm and had to take my coat off here, all right? I hope that's all right. Actually, the Bible says about ties, if it offends thee, cut it off. I ought to jerk this thing off too while I'm at it, but I'm going to be nice and respectful to God's house. 1 John 4, and verse 7 says, Beloved, let us love one another. Love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. It says when a person, one of the signs that a person's a Christian, there's a loyalty to Christ. Everyone that loveth loves God. And I want to tell you something. Uh, we live in a day today that God is first place in my life. And I love him for what he's done to me. In order to mean something to me, what does it mean? Look at verse 19. We love him because he first loved us. Who is that talking about? We love the Lord Jesus because he first loved me. You know what it means to be a Christian? One of the signs of new life in Christ is a love for Jesus Christ. I'm talking about a love for him. I have a wife back home. Her name is Kathy, and I love her. And one of the signs, when we first began to date, I was telling uh, your pastor we did everything wrong. Uh, in those days, I met my wife. Eight months later, we got married. Um, and and uh, four months of that, I was out to sea on the battleship Iowa. I planned our wedding from the Panama Canal. Uh, we were on the other side coming back and forth. And it was it was a pretty good deal. I just got to walk in, fellas. You know, uh, the, the, actually, we, got, we pulled into the port two days before my wedding. I, I walked in and uh, got married. That's the way it all to be amen just tell me where to stand and I'll be here and tell me what to put on and dress and it was a wonderful deal and and uh, we got married and I loved my wife and you know one of the signs that I loved her was I I didn't keep the pictures of other women in my I didn't keep the phone numbers of other women I, I didn't I got rid of all the rest of them I loved the, I loved her and it was evident because I didn't say well now honey I'm going to love you Monday through Friday but now on the weekends you know and that wouldn't went very far uh, now, honey, I love you, you know, nine to five, but now in the evenings, that's my own time. No, it was 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, 365 days. I'm telling you, I gave her my all. She gave me my all. And when it comes to a time that I say I'm a Christian and I love the Lord, listen, I don't just love him on Sunday. I love him on Monday. I don't just love him when there's nothing else going on. And one of the signs of this is a loyalty to Jesus Christ. Well, I can worship God. No, 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 no. Jesus Christ and him alone. A desire for, to love something, means you have a desire for that and you delight in that person and the interest of the one that you love. When my wife and I got married, we were two very different people. I was from Walterboro, South Carolina in the country. She had been raised in Navy towns. Her daddy was retired military. They had moved, I think, 17 times in, in uh, 15 years 
uh, been all over the place, been a city girl and uh, actually born in Idaho, I think it was, and I and, uh, was living in Virginia Beach, and we got married. I grew up riding dirt bikes and motorcycles and working on the farm. She had grew up in city, and I had only been saved for two years, had been a rough uh, redneck drunkard and pothead and all those kind of things. Grew up listening to, uh, to heavy-duty rock and roll and playing drums, percussion all those years and rock bands and all that kind of stuff. She had been uh, saved as a seven-year-old girl and, and raised in a Christian in school and her idea of rebellion you know was listening to soft rock music you know Barry Manilow or something and I, Barry Manilow you know and I, I just that just made me angry you know but anyhow I got saved and we we very different in our backgrounds I remember when we got married our first meal I sat down and I looked and she had the meats and the vegetables and she had mashed potatoes and I said where's the rice I'm from South Carolina. We have rice every dinner and supper. We don't have lunch and dinner, by the way. We have dinner and supper all of my life. I said, where's the rice? She said, I've never had rice. We had mashed potatoes with all our meals. And, and we were very different in some areas of our lives. But here's what happened because we loved each other. I began to get interested in the things she liked. And she got interested in the things that I love. To this day, she loves to ride a motorcycle. She never would drive one in a million years, but she loves them because she knows I love them. Uh, she loves, we, we, we've traded back foods. I had never had broccoli and cheese. We didn't eat broccoli in South Carolina. And, 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 but I love it. I tried it because she liked it. And, and, and some of the foods now, she loves uh, those same things. You want to know why? Because we love one another. I love the things she loves. I love her as a person. I love who she is. And I want to tell you, when a person, what are the signs of a Christian that I have life in Christ is I love him. I love the things that he loves. I want to be around him and his people. And that is one of the sure signs of being a child of God. Are you a child of God? See, I have a hard time with people. See, I'm a Christian. You ever read your Bible? That's the written word. He's the living word. Yeah, I'm a Christian. I don't think he needed to go to church all the time. It's the church in which he died for. I'm a Christian, but I'd rather be with the, the, the filthy mouth and the ungodly than I would with in God's house. And somebody said, I don't like uh, these hymns at church and, and, and all those old slow hymns. Listen, I don't like uh, going to church all the time. Listen, you're really not going to like heaven because as far as I can tell in Scripture, all we're going to do in heaven is praise Him. All we're going to do in heaven is sing to Him. It's not going to be entertainment night in heaven and, and Pat and Alan Hall get to do a routine. It's going to be Jesus, more Jesus, all of Jesus, and forever and ever and ever. And, and by the way, it's going to be a, a wonderful thing it is. And as a Christian, I should long for that and delight in that. Somebody said church is nothing more than practicing for heaven. And I want to love that. Look at 1 John 2, verse 5. Signs of new life in Christ. Whoso keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know that we are in him. One of the signs of new life in Christ is a keeping of the word of God. And, and now we live in a day, oh, you don't have to live that way. Uh, some of you are older and remember today that, that every Christian would live right. Whether it's a Baptist or Presbyterian or Methodist or, or whatever flavor, they might have worshipped differently. But when they left the building and went out in town, they lived the same. They lived a righteous life. They lived a holy life. Uh, we, we have some churches in Wilmington. I told them we have a, a black church in Wilmington. It's called the Soul Saving Station. I like that name. Now listen, uh, some, we say down south that, that white people go to church. Black people have church. You know, We go and we sit there. But I'm telling you, man, they get cranked up and they have church. You know, and They're clapping. and uh, they're, I, I want to preach one day with a towel around my neck with somebody on the organ. I've always wanted to do that. You know, emphasis while I'm, while I'm preaching. And, and do, listen. Listen, they worship differently. I'm, I'm down on the coast of North Carolina, and, and our folks are like you. They're, 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 they're listening, but they're more quiet. And then I'll go up into the mountains of North Carolina, and I, I'm up there preaching. And there's one church in Bryson City that on this side they have three pews, and it's where the seven deacons of the church sit. All right, Got to have seven. That's what they had in the Bible. They got seven deacons, do or die. They got seven deacons sitting over there on the side. And, and it sort of made me nervous, you know. But these guys are up there. And, and I'm telling you, I get to preaching. And little old ladies have their hankies and they're waving them. And, and those fellows are amen and me. And I'll get to preaching and I'll get up here. And I, there's sometimes I can't hear myself preaching because they're amening and shouting and, and waving their hankies. You say, man, I don't like that style of worship. That's fine then. Then the 
that we don't go to that church. Makes made my kids a little nervous the first time we went. They realized they love God. They live for the Lord. They live clean. Uh, they preach the gospel. They have different worship styles, but I'm telling you, they love God's word. And they live God's word. And the bottom line, the certainty that I'm a Christian is a love for the word of God. He, here's what he said there in chapter 2, verse 5. Hereby know that we are in him. Amen. We keep God's word and we live God's word. There's a sign of that. We don't know that we're in him because of my hairstyle. We don't know that we're in him because of, uh, because of a, a way I dress. We may look and identify of some things, and I believe you get saved in a Christian, we ought to clean up, and I believe we ought to look clean cut, and I believe we ought to wear our best for the Lord. But those things do not make us a Christian. Listen, David said, Oh, how I love thy law. I meditate in it all the day. Psalm 119, 127, I love thy commandments. And listen, he said, I love them more than gold, yea, than much fine gold. I love the Ten Commandments. I love the laws of God. And if that, that's the way, that's a sure sign that a person is a child of God. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I'm sorry that's not preached much today, but it's still the Bible. Certainty in Christ. 1 John 5, 1, again, I just read it a minute ago. Let me read it again. Whosoever believeth Jesus Christ is born of God, everyone that believeth or loveth him begot, loveth him also that is begotten of him. We know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. You know something else you love? When you know Christ, you love his church. You love his people. When I first started that church in Wilmington, we had a lady that came. Her name was Mrs. Ganey. And uh, she had uh, been out of church for many years. We met her. She started coming. She'd never driven a car before. We'd pick her up and bring her to church. We had our first fellowship dinner. Uh, we were meeting in a public elementary school for the first six years. And we had our first homecoming. Now, my first church as a homecoming was uh, an old traditional church. And uh, I didn't realize it when I got there. But I thought I was the pastor. But there were three ladies that thought they were the pastor. And we begin to have a little hard time and uh, uh, battles and going forth. We had homecoming dinner and we had a homecoming a fellowship hall out there. And I was up setting everything up on Sunday morning. And one of the fellows said, Preacher, don't be doing that. I said, Why? I'm just saying, Carol Ann's not going to like it. I said, Why is Carol Ann going to like it? I'm the pastor of church. I'm going to set up like I want to. Preacher, I'm telling you. And sure enough, Carol Ann and the other two ladies come in and moved everything around, set it up like they wanted. And the whole day during homecoming, instead of coming and listening to the preaching, they, were, they stayed in the back guarding the green beans. All right? They wanted to make sure that they were in the right place and everything was there. And, and I remember the day, and I, you know, I'm, uh, anyhow, I have a real nice wife, and I'm a little bit of a, uh, you, you know, anyhow, I, I have a hard time. And she'd come up to me, and she put her hands on her hips and said, Preacher, just what do you think you're doing? And, and being the nice, good Christian, I said, I said, I'm doing whatever in the world I want to do. And I moved the table. And we had an argument there, and I began to see. And so when I started this new church, I said, I'm telling you one thing. I said, I'm telling you. I said we have homecoming. We're not fighting over what in the green beans go on. Uh, we're not fighting over those things. I said, the most important thing going on in church is in here, not, not that the, where the vegetables are. We want to be in God's house and, 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 and worship God. And that's what's important. The food will be all right. Come on in to worship him. And that's something. Sunday, um, Mrs. Ganey had made a 16-layer cake. Are you all familiar with a 16-layer cake? You know, well, my wife and I were not. And we got, everybody did good and come into the church, and I sent Kathy and a few ladies out to get some stuff ready, and Kathy went out to the fellowship hall, and she was going to cut the cakes for the people. You know, thought she was doing good. You know, preacher's wife, they mean well, and, and Kathy went back there and cut the cakes, and all of a sudden, there's a line waiting to get into Fellowship Hall, and here comes Miss Ganey down the line with her finger out. Did you cut my cake? Did you, to everybody, we had visitors that day, did you cut my cake? Did you cut my, she's going down the line. I noticed Kathy sort of slid behind me, and, you know, and, and, I, and I said, what? She said, oh, no. She said, I cut Miss Ganey's cake. When she got up to us, I said, Miss Ganey, what's going on? She said, somebody cut my 16-layer cake, and they don't know. You don't cut a 16-layer cake like a pie. You cut it in half, and then you cut it in this way where you can see all the layers. You don't, and, and, and I'm going, Miss Ganey, we didn't know that. Now, you need to stop that and calm down, and we're not having that today. And, man, it riled me up, and we gave her a ride home. And on the way home, I was telling my wife, big bad preacher, you know, going to beat up the little old church lady. I said, I'm telling you, we're not having that mess in church. All those newcomers got offended. She 
she's got her finger in everybody's face and fussing at everybody and ruined the whole big day. I said, I'm not going to have that tonight. I'm going to tell her if she's going to act that way, she can't come back to our church. And we went that night and we picked Miss Ganey up, big bad preacher, you know, and she sits in the car and she looks over at me and tears begin to flow down her face. And she said, Brother Pat, can you ever please forgive me? And I said, what, why is that, Miss Ganey? She said, this morning I got upset over a silly cake. And she said, I might have hurt somebody's feelings or somebody in that church. Can I come to church tonight and ask everybody to forgive me for acting that way? And, and God showed me right then. She said, I love those people in that church. And I love that church. And I want to tell you one of the signs that a person is truly a child of God. They love the people of God. They want to be around them. I want to hang around them. I'd rather be here than anywhere I know. I don't want to offend anybody. I want to help one another. I want to build up and edify one another. And that is a sign of a certainty in Christ, this loyalty to the church of the living God. And I'm telling you, what kind of church would my church be if everybody in my church were just like me? You know, you heard about the guy riding down the road and, and he said, I'm looking for a church. And the guy said, what kind of church are you looking for? He said, well, I want a church that, you know, I can go to if I want to or not go to if I don't want to. And, you know, I, I want a church where the preacher doesn't come bother me and visit me. You know, if I want him, I'll come see him. And, and I want a church where they're not too preachy, you know. And I want a church where, you, you know, I just sort of ease in and ease out. And the guy said, well, sure, I know what the church you need is go down here, second left and third right and, and turn. And you'll see the church right there. And the guy come back a few minutes later and said, man, what are you doing? He said, what do you mean? He said, that church was all boarded up and the front doors were locked and had boards on the window. And grass was six foot high. It was shut down. He said, I... He said, what do you mean sending me to a church like that? He said, that's what becomes of a church like that when you wanted. Nobody committed. Come and go when I want to. There must be a love for the house of God and the people of God. And this church matters. There might be a hundred in town. But this one God spoke to my heart. This one God is the church I got. So this is the church that God wants me to be in. And, and there is a love for the house of God and the people of God. Look at 1 John 2, 29. 1 John 2, 29. Here's what it says. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. I'm going to say this quickly for time's sake. But I want to tell you a new certainty in Christ is a person begins to win some victories in their life. I, I'm asking you as a Christian, how do I know Christ is in me? There becomes a time that I begin to win some victories over sin in my own life. I'm saved, but I'm telling you, we battle with a sinful nature. And the Bible says that that person that believes in God does not commit sin. Now, I don't believe that's talking about sinless perfection, that I've arrived at a point that I'll never sin again. I believe it is that man does not continue in the practice of sin. One of the signs of true salvation and a belief in Christ is now when I do wrong, I feel guilty about it. It bothers me. I, I, might, I might have said something wrong yesterday, but that's not my practice. That's not the way I want to live. God forgive me. And, and it doesn't, uh, he doesn't continue willfully in that sin. I see folks that call themselves Christians and they sin and they love it and they're going to keep on doing it and nobody better. I'm telling you, a Christian, when he sins against God, when he lies or he says something wrong or offends somebody, it bothers him. The Holy Spirit of God in him convicts him of that sin and he begins to win some victories over those sins in his life. When I got saved, it is an 18-year-old young man, hair down in the middle of my back, filthy mouth, a rock and roller, living the lifestyle the world had to offer uh, in the bar rooms every Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night, playing rock music, living that lifestyle. And I'm telling you, when I became a Christian, and it wasn't me, brothers, what God does, I changed. Didn't take long that I thought, hey, I'm going to get my hair cut. Didn't take long uh, that I thought, hey, I'm, I, 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 listen, you cuss for 18, 20, 30 years, and the next, you get saved, the next day you hit your finger, you're not going to say, uh, God bless America, glory hallelujah you're going to say an old cuss word you've been practicing but immediately you're going to say God I'm sorry you're going to feel different when you do that 
When, you, when you've lived in these sins and immorality of the world, you may have a tendency or pull, but there's going to be something inside you. You're going to begin to win uh, some victories in our lives, victories over ourselves, victories over the world, the flesh and the devil, the Bible says. Yeah, I've heard people say, well, I'm a Christian, but I, I keep getting pulled back in sin. I'm telling you, here's what you do. You feed, you feed the spiritual side. You read your Bible. You pray. You get in God's house. You cut off the bad things. You cut off the bad, ungodly music. Cut off the ungodly TV, cut off the ungodly friends, and you'll find yourself growing and getting spiritually strong, and you'll win some victories. You may struggle, but you'll come out on the other side and say, man, I'm not a defeated Christian. I'm not a, a, a Christian without joy, a Christian without love, a Christian without peace, but God is blessing my life, and I'm winning some victories. There's a certainty that comes with Christ, and that is a victory in Christ, and a victory over the devil. The Bible says of the unsaved unbeliever that the devil does with them whatsoever he wills. That's what the shame is today. But there comes a time that a mark of new life in Christ is the devil stops just defeating me and winning victories over my life and he gets overcome in my life. He may assault you. He will oppress you. One of the sure signs of salvation is he's going to come after you hard. One of the sure signs of belief in Christ is he's going to try his best. to Your car is going to break down. You know, things are going to happen. But I'm telling you, a new life in Christ, a Christian can win some victories over them. When we talked about in 1 John that he might destroy the works of the devil, that's what Christ done. Greater is in he than he that is in the world. First of all, there's a certainty in Christ. Do you know for sure today you've been born again? You're in Christ under the blood and you, you have trusted him and confessed him as your Lord and Savior. Could you say him today and say, I have a loyalty to this Jesus. That's what a revival will do. A loyalty to Christ. I'm here. I'm going to stick here through thick or thin. Rain, sleet, snow or shine. I'm going to be in God's house. Uh, do, uh, one, one of our sisters here today, you uh, have been sick and not feeling good, but you come on in the church. That, that's, you know, I had a lady used to tell me, I can sit at home and hurt or I can come to church and hurt. I'm going to come on to God's house and you do the best you can. Uh, that's what you do. That's all God ever expects of us. But there comes a time that I'm loyalty to God and his word and his church and then when's the last time you won some victories when's the last time you battled with a sin and you overcame it one of the signs of a need of revival in the church today is lack of spiritual defeat among God's people I'm telling your pastor I've just dealt with the fifth preacher fundamental so-called godly preacher just fell into adultery out of the ministry, offended his wife and children in life. That's, that's who. Whatever happened to winning some victories in Christ? How, how do you live for God and Christ in your heart and on fire for God and revival fires burning in my soul? And one day look at another man's wife and say, I'm going to leave my wife for her. I had a preacher friend that said they had the handshaking time at church. And a man from this side left his wife and children and walked over to a woman from this side standing beside her husband and kids and said, preacher's not going to like this, but i got to say it. And she said, what's that? He said, I love you. <laughs> I, you know, I, I told the preacher you should have drug him by the hair of the head out the front door of the church and slung him out in the yard. You know, let his wife beat the daylights out of him, her husband beat the daylights out of him, and everybody in church line up. Could you believe that? That's Friday night barroom stuff. We ought, to win. we ought to be in church. God's people ought to be. I've got folks that get saved and they battle hard. I've had a guy tell me it's harder to quit smoking cigarettes than it is to quit heroin. That's what Doug Rogers tells me. But as a Christian, I can win some victories in my life. I, from my old background from rock and roll and drugs and those things, things are in my mind today. I've been saved uh, uh, coming on 30 years. And I can hear a rock music song from back then and it's as fresh as in my mind, and the things that I was doing at this, while listening to that music are right there in my mind, but I'm telling you, they no longer have a power over me. I've got something. I can quote a Bible verse. I can sing a good song. I can come something and win some victories over this old flesh of mine. There, do you have new life in Christ? If you've never been born again, today would be a good time to come and kneel and say, I want to know for sure that I am in Christ. If you are a Christian today, you ought to come down and say, I want to win some victories in my prayer life. 
I'm going to be loyal to God and His Word. I'm going to I love the Lord Jesus Christ and want Him to know that today. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, today as we call upon Your name, I thank You for these dear folks and their attentiveness and just what a kind group they have been here today. And I ask You, O oh God, that You would speak to our hearts even now. I pray that we would have new life in Christ. And not just new life in Christ, but a fullness to this life in Christ. Maybe there's some folks that need to step up in faithfulness and commitment and loyalty to you, Lord. Turn away from this old world and fall in love with Jesus again. Maybe there's some folks that have been defeated, getting beat up and oppressed and bothered. I pray that today we would get in Christ and begin to win some victories, personal, family, Lord, in our, in our daily lives, may we come and ask for those victories. And if there's one here today that is not sure of their eternal home in heaven, may they settle it today. We ask and pray these things in Christ's name, amen. Would you stand, please? Would you stand? This morning, if God has spoken to your heart, heads bowed, nice clothes, we... Uh, we're not going to have a musician. You can. She's gonna, okay. All right. We have someone. All right. Preacher's daughter's going to come play the piano. We're going to have an invitation. This is an opportunity for you to come and seal. God spoke to your heart about something to come and ask forgiveness, to come and make a, a vow to the Lord, uh, come to receive Christ as your Savior. I'm going to ask you that you'd come this morning as they begin to play and sing. Right now, you step out and come if God's spoken to your heart right now this morning. Heads bowed, eyes closed, but God's speaking to your heart. You'd like to win some old victories here and there. You need Christ in your life. You need an assurance of your salvation. It's time to settle some things. Lord, I believe. I trust in you. If you died today, would heaven be your home? Do you know that for sure? We're going to play another verse. Won't you come? You're not sure if you died today, you'd go to heaven. You don't have the certainty of Christ. It's not been evident in your life. Live defeated. Still love this old world, lots of sorrow and problems and pain. Won't you come to Christ today? Anyone need to come? God, here's my life. Give me this Christ, this certainty. Help me to be victorious in some areas of my life. Won't you come? Just one more verse. If you come now, you need to come. Won't you come? I'd ask you to invite you, treat you, plead with you, beg with you. Don't leave here defeated. Come to Christ today. closed. There's some in this place today that know in your heart that you're not right with God. You know for sure that you've never become a Christian. You've never asked Christ to come inside, but for some reason, for some reason, you keep postponing, postponing, putting it off, putting it off. I, I don't know what the reason may be this morning. I don't know what your thinking may be, but I do know that is the single greatest decision you'll ever make in this life. Don't put it off any longer if you need to be saved this morning. And then I know there's some others here today that you're allowing sin to creep into your life. My friend, if you're a Christian, that doesn't have to be so. You can have victory in Christ. Don't give place to the devil. Don't let him have an inch in your life. If there's something this morning you say, I can feel it, I, I, I see it coming into my life, I, I, I've been doing some things, I've been going to some places, 
been even thinking some things that I shouldn't. Why not come to Jesus today and say, I need you. I need your strength. I need your power. I can't defeat sin on my own, but I can in Jesus' name. I need you. Is that you today? Why not right there at your seat this morning, why not just bow your head and say, Christ, I need you. I need you to do something in my life. I need you to stir my soul. I need to have a greater concern for the lost. I need to get victory over sin in my life. Whatever it may be, if you'll call upon his name, he'll answer. He'll come. He'll give the strength you need. He'll give the victory in your life that you need. If you only ask, would you do that right now as we pause just for a few moments? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you today and we thank you so much for loving us first. And we ask that you would help us to prove our love to you each and every day by simply keeping your commandments. Lord, we've heard this morning the truth from your word about the signs of whether or not we even have a relationship with you. I pray that as Brother Pat preached those this morning that every single person in this place today just kind of made a mental checklist and they made their way down through that list and asked themselves, is that evidence in my life? Is that proof in my life that I know the Lord? Am I serving him like I should? And Lord, if things are not right between us and you today, I pray that before we leave this place, that we'd simply go before you, we'd settle it in our heart. Lord, we'd make things right with you. Lord, thank you for the words that we heard this morning. Thank you for meeting with us. Thank you for your precious Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray that the things that we've learned today and we've been challenged with this week that we would not forget, but we take with us. And Lord, we'd use it to gain victories in our life. And we'd use it to share with others and share with them how they can have victory in their life. And Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen.